Hello, hello everyone. Welcome back to SCP Resurrection. Today we are going to be reading the stories Pythia's Wing by Deadly Moose and Number One with a Bullet by Dr. Clef. I hope that you enjoy and let's get right into it. Pythia's Wing you want to bring back Omega-7? What did you expect? Ten smiled uncertainly. Not bring back, she said. Resurrect in a new form. Better. The oracle's laughter vibrated in the air. Personable, yet inhuman. This was not a good sign. Technically, Ten and her allies had not acted incorrectly by starting the Alpha-9 project without explicit approval from the rest of the Council. Technically. Ten and Nine had come to see the Oracles together. The Oracles were each SCPs in the technical sense, but like all Black Box SCPs, they had no special containment procedure files. No one below the Council and their staff even knew they existed. They had no numbers. Only descriptors. The oracle Ten intended to see was the Steel Man. Ten said little as they made the long trip in the quiet railway car. She gripped her tablet computer harder than usual. An alien moon shone above, and unfamiliar stars glittered in the black sky. They rode across the long slot flats of the in-between places, the destination away from reality and time. Nine didn't object to her silence, and for this, Ten was grateful. The black sky lightened, and the unearthly dawn came as they reached their destination. Ten and Nine disembarked and stood in front of the vast glass archive that housed the oracles, a complex that hung from the sky like a spiderweb. Only the entryways touched the ground. The oracles' white robe guardians came out to meet them. They were ever silent with no mounts. Their left hands were golden chains attached to gleaming lanterns. They led Ten through the holes of the frosted glass structure to the steel man's chamber. Through the translucent walls of the structure, Ten could see vague impressions of the white robed guardians moving like ghosts through the maze. In the adjacent waiting room, a blurred shadow that was her assistant, Salt, paced back and forth. A gallery of shadows lurked in the adjoining rooms, other oracles which Ten had deliberately denied herself clearance to see. The chamber was an atrium on the edge of the complex, looking out over a lush valley too garish to ever have existed on Earth. Atop a low platform decorated with intricately carved ivory inlays crouched a monstrous many-armed hulk, hidden underneath a white and gold robe that filled the room to its corners. He had many faces, and each one was a mask carved from ivory, jade, redwood, and obsidian. The only other thing in the room was a single chair carved from bones of a primordial beast, which Ten took. Welcome, the steel man said. Speak. The oracle's laughter vibrated in the air. Ten said more. He laughed more. You are laughing at me quite a lot, Ten said. Perhaps this is why no one comes to talk to you. I exist to serve, the steel man said. As with the other oracles, I am yours to heed or disregard as you please. Then speak. Very well. You are the newest organ of the Overseer Council. There have been an uncommon number of additions to this council in the last twenty years, your friend, Nine, being one of them. The steel man lowered his gaze. Ten followed his line of sight through the glass floor. Nine stood in the valley below, on a mountain slope close to the bottom of the glass building. She was alone, leaning on her walking stick. Perhaps she was just waiting. Ten wasn't familiar with all the oracles here, which wasn't unusual for a council member. Even when you could know everything, you knew there were some things you didn't want to know. 
She had considered and dismissed the idea of visiting one of the more powerful and more alien oracles. Nine had always thought different. She is more human than you are, the steel man said. The most human of all of you. We are all human. In the technical sense, another chuckle. She is your strongest ally. You realize the ramifications, yes? You are the only member of the Council newer than her. I've been in the Foundation longer than she has. She is an exception. She was chosen to be an exception. Nine was... unique. She had discovered the existence of the Anomalous without ever finding out about the Foundation, and... been recruited into the Overseer's Council without ever rising through the ranks of the Foundation. The Council had needed a new Nine, and badly wanted an outside perspective. They have invested much in her, the Steel Man said. They will not be eager to admit their experiment failed, but you? They can get another archivist, just like when they executed your predecessor. Perhaps your assistant, Salt, or that exceptional director, Maria Jones. Ten winced. Then perhaps my foolishness will benefit another. She looked down at Nine. Is she waiting for an oracle? She is speaking to one. Where? In the mountain. The steel man's highest face smiled. The Oracle of Earth speaks to very few, and not for long. She seems to favor nine. That is, perhaps, not surprising. Ten nodded. We digress, the steel man said. You began this project on your own. With allies, yes, but very few. Why? I didn't think it would come to a council vote, Ten admitted. And that is why you are here now. Yes, Ten said. I imagine this is why you're an oracle. The steel man chuckled approvingly. Tell me, what are you thinking when you chose to do things this way? Ten hesitated. I was thinking that it was better to ask for forgiveness than permission. Your immediate predecessor would have agreed, the steel man said. Allow me to suggest that this is why he had the shortest tenure of any council member within my memory. Ten thought of SCP-003. I'm not even close to that foolish, she said. Indulge me, the steel man said. Do you know the last time that the Council lost this many members within twenty years? The Foundation Civil War, Ten said. Yes, the creation of the Chaos Insurgency by rogue overseers. You are aware the precise details? Or their motives? Of course, the man who was seven. Come now, come now, the steel man interrupted. Yes, Seven provided their rhetoric. Seven crystallized their operations and provided the name. His rhetoric was and is very effective, as the large number of promising young recruits snapped up by the insurgency proves. It is true that Seven was unhappy and wished for a loosening of protocol, but Seven did not start the insurgency. In fact, Seven never planned to defect from the Foundation at all. Ten was quiet. You do not need me to learn these things, the steel man said. All the records are open to you. I've been preoccupied, Ten said. Contrary to popular belief, I'm still human. Ah, uh, yes, the steel man said. I imagine you have been preoccupied indeed. I would envy you were I human. As the Archivist, you possess knowledge even the other Council members do not share. Each time the world has ended, each time it has been restored. One could even call you an Oracle yourself, and yet, here you are. His masks stared into the distance. I came to hear your perspective, Ten said. 
So, how would you characterize the beginning of the insurgency? Her number was 11. She was possessed of far too much knowledge for her own good, even for one of you. What happened? She became consumed with a singular idea. She wished for the Foundation to increase its research into the anomalous. The masks looked meaningfully at Ten. She was called the Warden. She developed many of the Foundation's early containment procedures. She felt that we were handicapped by limiting ourselves to containment without understanding. It was her argument that this was not truly containment at all. I see where this is going, Ten said. Those do resemble the principles behind the Resurrection Project. Eleven also wished for us to reclassify humanoids into a separate category. She lobbied for our soldiers and researchers to work with humanoid anomalies as equals. Ten hesitated. Alpha Nine isn't nearly so radical. Perhaps it is closer than you wish to admit. The steel man spread his arms. Eleven forced the issue at the council, as you have done now. When the others would not be swayed, she and her allies defected from the Foundation. I would never consider starting a second insurgency. Wouldn't you? He let the words linger. Of course you wouldn't, but they might not believe that. All the masks focused on Ten. Pit the Foundation against the Global Occult Coalition. Who will win? Ten stared at the Steel Man. This wasn't the first time she'd heard the question, but never before so directly. Will you not answer? Well, the Coalition has a far greater number of active paramilitary assets. They have direct diplomatic ties with UN member nations, giving them freedom of movement through those nations. They are, however, hampered by their role as the UN-affiliated peacekeeping and reaction force. They have far fewer paranormal assets, but they are more likely to make use of them. We have the defensive advantage. They have the offensive advantage. Ten paused. But the Coalition will not come into open conflict with us as long as we don't represent an existential threat, she went on. They prize secrecy too much. It's all theoretical. It may be less theoretical very soon, the Steel Man said. What about the O-R-I-A? O-R-I-A? Or... Perhaps the Horizon Initiative, the insurgency, were it to receive a new swell of support, the Serpents had, the Forgotten Sons, even the UIU with an influx of funding. I don't see... Ten trailed off. What if you provoke them all to move against the Foundation at the same time? The steel man asked. Who wins? I don't know. Ten felt a sinking feeling in her gut. We can't know. But you should be asking the question nonetheless. Ten looked down at Nine again. As if response, Nine pivoted away from the mountain. She faced the valley and raised her walking stick like Moses parting the Red Sea. The valley rumbled like thunder. The ground shook. In the distance, a vast plateau rose into the air. Ten watched in astonishment. The thunder grew louder and then settled, along with the new forested mesa in the center of the valley. Nine lowered her walking stick and stood over the valley, observing her apparent handiwork. Ten smiled. There is another name you should consider besides Levin, the steel man said. Kondraki. 
Ten shook her head. I know eight will make the comparison, but that's foolish. Kondraki destroyed Site-19 with intent. That's why he had to go. Then why did the Council wait so long to order his assassination? What convinced them to finally act? I'm not certain precisely what you mean to imply, Ten said. Of course you are certain. The steel man gave her a grin from his highest face. Ten turned away. She was certain. She just hadn't wanted to make the parallel. At the height of Kondraki's power within the Foundation, he had campaigned for weaponization of SCPs. He'd promoted the expansion of anomalous task forces like Omega-7. And why wouldn't he, given his bond with SCP-408? He had begun to strike out on his own, without the rubber stamps of his higher-ups. The Council had feared he would start another insurgency. They had concluded that he was too dangerous to let live. And then there were the other agents that Kondraki's death had silenced. What do you recommend I do? Ten asked. What you should have done at the beginning. Go to the others. Ask for their support. Ten nodded. What else? Expect this to go badly for you. For the first time in the conversation, all the masks were grinning. And be very grateful if it does not. End of Pythia's Wing We will now check out number one with a bullet. Number one with a bullet. Two days prior. You want to shoot? The dog asked. Are you sure? Adams is going to need it, Clef said, especially if the Coalition starts stepping up their efforts. Professor Kane Pathos Crow gave a low, angry growl. He slapped his front paw against a button on his console, and the finely completed Egg Walker folded up into its storage configuration and rolled up the ramp. You should take her off the task force, he said angrily. She's not ready. She's going to be ready, Crow, Clef said, and she's going to be one of the best assets the Foundation has ever had. Call it a hunch. I don't intend to have my most important creation put at risk of destruction on one of your hunches, Clef, Professor Crow retorted. I spent months, years. I know what you're worried about, Clef interrupted. But Adams can do it. She just needs that goddamn suit. Kane Pathos Crow gave his old friend an angry glare. He glided his little hopper platform past a pair of large water tanks, where a couple of white-coated researchers were apparently conferring with a pair of nightmarish sea monsters with long tentacles and glowing spots all over their bodies. Elliot! He barked. Yes, King? A thirty-something woman stuck her head up from behind a desk where she had apparently been working on a computer. Her eyes were large and surprised-looking, and she pushed her glasses up from where they had been sliding down her nose. Would you get Dr. Clef the suit? Kane asked. We're not completely done with... Yes, we are, Kane said. We don't need to put all the markings and numbers... What we have now will suffice. Right, Dr. Elliot said. She dashed into a back room, from which the sound of rummaging could soon be heard. Isn't that the one who was with Adams and one of five in that stupid bar crawl incident? Clef asked. She was the getaway driver, Professor Crow replied. And she's a damn good researcher, too. Gonna take her away from me, too? Not planning on it, Clef said. The suit should do just fine. That's not what I meant, Professor Crow said. They promised me that they'd reactivate Olympia. It's been days and I haven't heard anything else. What gives? A bit impatient, aren't we? Clef laughed. 
Look, I wouldn't worry too much yet. You'll get your girls back soon enough. Their conversation was interrupted by Dr. Elliot returning with a silver case under one arm and a sleek black helmet under the other. Here you go, she said, huffing and puffing. These are flexible solar panels and the fabric. It should keep it going for most of the time, but you're gonna... You're gonna have to plug it in every once in a while. I'll figure it out, Clef said. Thanks. He picked up the suitcase and helmet. Hey, look at the bright side, Crow. If I'm wrong, we'll all probably die. Then you can tell me I told you so. Only if dogs don't go to heaven, Kane said deadpan. Day one. All right, Adams, the voice said over the loudspeaker. How'd you like the suit? I look like a video game character, Adams complained. The suit was form-fitting and jet black and a bit shiny too, supposedly from the flexible photoelectric cells embedded into the fabric. The sexy spy cat suit look alone was enough to make Adams cringe, but there were the faintly glowing bits and the dark red decorative piping. What the hell is this thing? Leftovers from an abandoned project from Omega-7 era, Clef said. It's a bit complicated, but think of it as an enhanced combat armor. Okay, Adam said, raising her hands and clenching her fists. Despite the tight fit, the suit didn't seem to restrict her movements. Will Alpha Niner be issued these two? Nope, just you, Clef said. Technically, everything in that room is subject to special containment procedures. The procedures in this case are, if Adams breaks or loses them, she's in deep shit. So, take care of them, capiche? Yes, sir, Adam said, putting as much sarcasm as she could handle into her salute. Clef chuckled. All right, we'll start with sensory input. Put on the helmet, close your eyes, and count to ten. By the time you open them, the vision systems should have activated. Adam slid the helmet over her head and locked it into place. It fit snugly, as if it were made for her, and it almost certainly was. She followed Clef's instructions and closed her eyes. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Adams opened her eyes. Something behind her eyes went click. The world exploded into painful color. The light didn't so much as pierce her eyes as barrel through like a juggernaut. Adam staggered, her optic nerves ablaze with an overload of information. She clawed at the faceplate of the featureless black helmet, struggling to get it off. Get it off. Get it. Adams, Clef said. His voice was painfully loud. Adams, listen to me. Focus. Concentrate. Concentrate on my voice. She closed her eyes again, took deep breaths tried to drown out the pounding of her terrified heart through force of will. Too much, too much color, she gasped. Can't, can't see. Adams, listen to me. It's feeding information directly into your visual cortex, everything from gamma rays through infrared. You just need to filter. Don't know how. Adams wept as she pounded the visor of her helmet against the concrete floor. The blurring of her tears twisted her vision further, which didn't help her current situation at all. Can't, can't control. Yes, you can, Clef snapped. It's just like going from a dark room to a light of one. Your eyes will change the way you see the light. Your brain will change the way you process the information. You just have to give it time to get used to it. Open your eyes, Adam. Don't be afraid. His voice took on a sneering, condescending tone. Or are you just an air-headed office bunny like everyone thinks you are? Oh, fuck you, Clef. Rising her eyelids, those few scant millimeters, was the most terrifying thing she'd ever done. When she did, she wanted to scream. She didn't do it. She refused to let that smiling asshole see her weakness again. The explosion of information didn't quite lessen. More like... She grew accustomed to the insane amount of data pouring into her brain. She started picking up the important bits, filtering the junk, disregarding the noise to focus on the data. In a few moments, she was able to stand, breathe, 
slow her racing heart back into something resembling its normal resting state. She looked up at the observation room with its bulletproof window. Dr. Clef? A metallic click. Yes, Adams? Please don't insult the office assistants again or I'll report you to our superiors for another round of sensitivity training. She heard Clef chuckle. Yeah, understood, Adams. Day two. It's all right, Adams, Clef said. Seems like you've gotten the hang of the first part of what the helmet can help you do. Now it's time for the second part. Up in the observation lounge, the window turned black as a polarizing light filter activated. One of the walls of the test chamber lit up, displaying a swirling pattern of lights. Adams immediately recognized the distinct orchid and worm patterns of a Berryman Langford mimetic hazard. She let out a shriek of surprise and closed her eyes. Open your eyes, Adam, Clef ordered. Are you fucking insane? Adams shouted. With a live cog hazard in the same room as me? You will be protected from its harmful effects, Clef said. Open your eyes. Adams opened her eyes. It wasn't that she wasn't being affected by the deadly pattern swirling on the screen. It was more that she could recognize what it was trying to do and was able to deny it. The image on the wall was trying to tell her heart to stop. But like a child putting her fingers in her ears and yelling loudly, she could somehow drown out that voice. Congratulations, Adam, Clef said. You are now one of the few uninoculated people to ever see a Barry Langford mimetic kill agent and live. What's it like? Why don't you clear your windows and see for yourself? Clef chuckled. <laughs> I think I'll pass. All right, let's try some audio hazards next. Then we're going to repeat yesterday's exercises on ultraviolet and upper EM spectrum tracking. I think I'm starting to get the hang of it. Adam said. Though I think infrared would be more useful. Not many humans give up ultraviolet or gamma rays. I've got my reasons, Adams. I'll explain later. For now, let's continue the lesson. Day 3. All right, Adams, Clef said. I think that's enough for the helmet. Now it's time to test the suit. He pressed a button and a minigun popped out of the hatch on the other side of the room and opened fire. Adams tumbled back as the force of the bullets knocked her to the ground, pummeling her with supersonic projectiles. I get it, she shouted. The suit's bulletproof. Let me up. Of course the suit's bulletproof, Clef said. That's just the first part of the test. Another hatch popped open, and the muzzle of a large caliber anti-material rifle emerged from a gun port in the wall. Oh shit, Adams thought. The rifle fired. Something behind her eyes went click. Adams felt the round punch into her left arm. She felt the pain for an instant. Then, it was as if all the agony just went away. She knew her arm was hurting. She didn't care. It was just pain. The rifle's muzzle turned. The next round hit her in the forehead. Then the back of her head hit the ground. She shook her head as stars exploded behind her eyes. Up above her, a ceiling panel opened up. Then a grand piano fell on her. The minigun ceased firing. The rifle pulled back in behind the gun port. There was only silence broken by the sound of hot brass clattering to the concrete floor. With the sound of snapping piano strings, a fist punched through the splintered wood, followed by another fist, then a head and shoulders. All right, Clef said. Let's review. The suit will stop penetration, although not impact, of rounds up to .50 caliber browning. It will also stiffen against broader area impacts. Also, it will enhance your strength and speed up to half a shattered piano smashed against the observation deck window. Clef chuckled. <laughs> I guess you've found that out already. Next exercise. Day four. All right, Adams, Clef said. Let's talk guns. Are you gonna shoot me again? She was still pissed about the piano thing. No. Today, you're gonna be the one doing the shooting. One of the walls slid open, revealing a firing range beyond. The walls and ceiling were covered in what appeared to be battleship armor, and the bullet trap was a long, heavily armored cone the length of a football field. 
There's a Mark VII sidearm on the firing line, Cliff said. Go ahead and load it. Adams walked to the firing line, picked up the pistol, checked the chamber and magazine. Should be a piece of cake, she said as the slide snapped home. I've always been good at marksmanship. I know, Cliff said, but this drill is a bit different. Pop up targets at unknown ranges. Your goal is to place ten rounds into each. Ready? Ready, Adams said, taking up her firing stance. Begin. The red light lit up, and the speakers let out a buzz. A small white circle about the width of a baseball flipped up at the end of a metal arm. Adams raised the pistol and tracked the target, lining up the front sight with the center of the circle. She exhaled halfway, took up the slack on the trigger. The target dropped away. The red light flashed and the speakers buzzed. Zero points, Clef said. Next target. Wait, what? Another target flipped up at the end of a metal arm. Adams brought the weapon around, lined it up. The target fell away. Red light. Buzz. Zero points, Clef said. Stop thinking, just do it. Your body's trained, you know the motions. Focus your mind on finding the targets and let your muscle memory do the rest. But another target flipped up. Adams spun and opened fire. One hit, two hits, three... The target fell away. Two points, Clef said. You need to fire faster. That's insane, Adams protested. You can't get groupings that tight that fast. No, they can't get groupings that tight that fast. You are wearing a highly sophisticated combat suit. Your abilities are far beyond that of any human. You can do this. Next target. Another surge of anger blazed through her blood. Something behind her eyes went click. She put the first round into the next target before it had flipped completely into place. The second and third quickly followed. The fourth clipped the upper edge of the target. She pushed down the muzzle of the pistol and put five and six back into the center. She put two more into the target before it fell away behind the beam. Eight points, Clef said. Not bad. Next target. But I'm out of ammo, Adams protested. Red light, buzz. Reload faster, zero points, Clef said. Adam swore as she grabbed a magazine from the firing line and slammed it into place. Day five. All right, Adams, take five. What the hell happened? Adams cleared and saved her weapon, then inspected the damage. The trigger hung loosely in the lower receiver, giving no resistance to the touch of her fingertips. You pulled the trigger before the bolt returned fully, Clef said. When you did, you must have broken something in the trigger group. You were literally firing faster than the weapon can cycle. The Mark 19 carbine has a cyclic rate of 950 rounds per minute, Adam said. Yeah, I know, Clef said. You're faster. Adams put the rifle down on the table. Okay, I'm a little bit freaked out now, she said. What the hell is this suit, anyway? A long pause. I guess you do deserve an explanation, Clef admitted. All right, get changed and meet me outside. It's lunchtime, anyway. So, Clef said, rummaging through the picnic basket. Do you want turkey or beef? Turkey, Adam said. Hold the hallucinogens. Clef laughed. I only did that once, and it was for a seminar. The walls were alive, and my purse was trying to eat me, and you were screaming about how you were a living god. I have no desire to repeat the experience. You handled it better than most, Clef said. Poor Chang was clawing at the tablecloth. He handed one of the two sandwiches to Adams. All right, down to business. Do you know anything about the Bowie Commission? A little bit. It was before my time. Hmm. Okay. Uh, once upon a time, the Foundation wasn't the international independent organization it is today. He opened up a little foil packet of mayonnaise and spread it liberally over both halves of his bread. It needed help, especially funding and manpower. It found both through a man named General Bowie. I've heard of him, Adam said. I don't know much about him, though. Well, General Bowie was the head of the U.S. military's secret paranormal research branch, Clef said, spreading potato chips over the upper half of his sandwich. 
Gold War diehard. He truly believed that the Soviet Union was an empire of evil, godless monsters, the whole deal. They went to the GOC, but the UN wasn't interested in helping the US build up a private arsenal. General Bowie needed to find someone with enough resources to fulfill his needs, but outside the Aegis of the United Nations. Us? Adams asked. The Foundation, Clef confirmed. He picked the tomatoes out of his sandwich and tossed them onto his sandwich wrapper. Match made in heaven, right? We get our money and an unlimited supply of convicts. They get their weapons, hence the research. Hence the increase in field teams and security forces. And especially hence MTF Omega-7, a mobile task force made up of humanoid anomalies. Except Omega-7 failed, Adam said. Abel killed them all. Yep. Bowie wanted soldiers, but what he got was a psychopath and a teenager. What he needed was someone who was good at killing, but who was also controllable. 76 was good at killing, but he could never be controlled. 105 followed orders, but she was never really a killer, no matter how hard they tried to turn her into one. So one of the other researchers came up with a different approach. The suit? Adams asked. Pretty much, Clef said. Instead of turning an anomaly into a soldier, you train up a soldier and give it the power of an anomaly. That suit you're wearing represents the end result of that project. Adams steepled her fingers as Clef tore open his little packets of salt and pepper and sprinkled them onto his sandwich. So how come everyone knows about Iris and Abel, but no one's ever heard of this suit before? She asked. It was an early prototyping when SCP-076 killed Omega-7, and O5 shut down all weaponization of anomalies. Clef put the other half of his bread on top and pressed down firmly, crunching the potato chips. Up until I asked Crow to resurrect one of his old projects for you, the suit wasn't completed. I've never met Professor Kane Pappas Crow, Adam said thoughtfully. Maybe I should consult him regarding improvements to the suit's design. Improvements? Clef scowled. Why the hell does the suit need improvements? It's not exactly comfortable for one, Adam said. Rides up a bit, and it takes forever to put on and take off. Adams? Clef said. You focus on keeping SCP-105 alive and being ready to put a bullet in her head if she turns bad. That's your job. My job is dealing with the eggheads and bureaucrats. You want to ask Crow for improvements, you send the requests through me. Capiche? Capiche, Adam said, rolling her eyes. Day six. All right, Adams, Clef said. Today we're going to talk about why the entire firing range is armored like a tank. I assume it has something to do with this gigantic rifle on the side table. You assume correctly. Pick it up. Adams hefted the enormous gun. Even with the suit taking most of the weight, the weapon was incredibly unwieldy. What the hell does this thing fire? 20 millimeter cannon shells. The same kind they put in fighter jets. What am I going to do with this? Blow up a tank? You could, Clef said. Or you could find the Global Occult Coalition. I'm listening, Adam said, perking up. Good, Clef replied. A GOC strike trooper in a white suit is basically a human-sized tank. It can run at speeds upwards of 60 miles an hour. It can shrug off weapons fire up to and sometimes beyond .50 caliber BMG. It can be dropped by parachute from a plane or a port in with the age of a thaumaturge. And most importantly, Clef said, tapping a control on his console, it's fucking invisible. Six dummies clad in white suits of armor materialized on the firing range. Jesus, Adams shouted, recoiling in surprise. He's too busy to help you, Clef said. Now our invisibility tech isn't as advanced as the GOC's, but this should suffice for training. A white suit's Pavise system renders it invisible to infrared and visible light, but they're somewhat visible in the ultraviolet and upper EM spectrum. 
none of which matters because they're also shrouded by cognitohazardous compulsion not to notice them. And if you get past both of these defenses, you've still got to find a bullet big enough to punch through their armor. This suit, Adam said as understanding dawned. It makes me just as fast and as strong as a white suit. The helmet senses ultraviolet and upper EM and filters out cognito hazards, and the rifle. The rifle is our current best chance to punch through a white suit's armor without it also taking out an entire city block. Clef's voice was low and grim. I'm not going to lie to you, Adams. Even with all these upgrades, your chances in a one-on-one -on -one fight aren't much better than 50%. And strike teams deploy in squads of eight, plus commander, all in white suits. So those are their heavy hitters, then? Hell no, Clef said. The heavy hitters are orange suits, but nothing can fight a UHEC, so we're not even going to try. If you see something that looks like a cartoon robot and sounds like a monster, just fucking run. Well, this isn't exactly doing wonders for my confidence. Adams dug the toe of her boot into the floor. You're telling me I'm screwed. No, Clef said. I'm telling you, you've got about a 1% chance of taking on a GOC strike team and winning which is better than anyone else in the Foundation's chances, which is a big, fat, stinking zero. Now, stand on the line and engage your sensors. I'm going to recloak the target. When I say go, you will have about ten seconds to engage and destroy them all. Is that all? Adams asked sarcastically. She inserted a magazine the size of a phone book into her enormous weapon. Nope. A hatch opened, and a fifty caliber machine gun emerged from that damned gun port. You're going to do it all while getting shot at. Adam swore. She ducked behind a concrete barricade as a burst of heavy machine gun fire punched big holes through absolutely everything. From Assistant Director Alto Clef, Division of Training and Development, 205 Council. Re. Mobile Task Force TAV-666, Operation Elpis. Asset Semek has completed familiarization training with Phase 2 equipment. Current rate of integration is estimated at 25%. As of writing this report, amnestic treatments and false memory constructs continue to hold. Per pre-existing standing orders, Asset Semek remains unaware of its prior identity. I will continue to monitor Asset Samek's progress and tr provide training and support as needed. Dr. Clef. Priority message. Palisade Broken Menagerie. Repri 5 Pale BM. At 1875 hours local time, Aid Grape detected internet traffic indicating a possible broken menagerie, anomalous threat in wild incident. Foundation agent was deployed to Redacted Redacted Hospital in Redacted MI. Confirmed occurrence of SCP-008 in wild. Mobile Task Force Beta-5 Babysitters to prepare for immediate deployment. Elements of Mobile Task Force Alpha-9 Last Hope and Lambda-2 NNE to accompany MTF-B5 as observers. From O5 Council to Dr. Alto Clef, Commander, Mobile Task Force TAV-666. Re. Mobile Task Force TAV-666 Operation Elpis. Asset Resh-2 to be released from storage and returned to Asset Resh. Asset Samic is to be deployed with Phase 2 equipment as security detail for Asset Resh. Assets Resh and Samek will deploy with Mobile Task Force Beta 5 as observers. Let's get Iris some hands-on experience before we possibly get shut down forever. 05-7 It felt oddly right to be back in tactical gear again. The equipment had changed, but its purpose had not. 
to make sure her most vital gear was carried in a comfortable but easily reachable fashion. Iris tied her boots tightly and tucked the ends of her laces under the tongue of her boot. Adrian had showed her a neat trick that would make sure that the lacing didn't slip and her shoes didn't come untied. It had taken a few tries to remember how it worked, but once she'd gotten it right, the way the boots gripped her ankles felt proper. She was pulling a blue long sleeve shirt over her tank top when the woman's locker room door opened. And Miss Emma Peel walked in, except it wasn't Miss Emma Peel. It was Adams in a close fitting black catsuit. What the hell are you wearing? Iris asked. Anomalous tech, Adam said. It's some kind of super suit. She put down a silver pistol case and a helmet that looks like something straight out of Power Rangers. You look like Catwoman, Iris said. Adam sighed. I'm gonna get so many stupid comments, aren't I? Look at the bright side, Iris said. Everything's gonna be so busy staring at you that no one will want to shoot at me. Thanks a lot, Adams grumbled. She fished her tactical vest from her locker, pulled out her plate inserts, and tossed them to the floor, handling the ceramic plates as if they were playing cards. You're not going to wear the plates? Iris asked, shrugging into her own armored vest. Won't stop anything this damn suit can't, Adam said, pulling the Kevlar on and closing the clasps. Oh, by the way, I brought you an old friend, she gestured to the pistol case. Iris gulped. She undid the latches on the gun case and opened the cover, slowly and reverently. A Polaroid camera lay nestled within a black foam. She ran a finger over the familiar scuff mark on the bottom left edge. We were able to find a few cartridges of original Polaroid film in our stocks, Adam said, strapping her pistol belt around her waist. Not sure if it'll work after all this time, so we also brought three more of that new stuff. Good? Yeah, Iris said. We're good. She checked the straps and gave them a brief tug, then slung the camera and its protective case over her shoulder. Feeling that old, familiar weight fall into place on her left hip felt good like coming home after a long trip abroad. Hey, Adam said, giving the younger woman a confident grin. Don't fret. This is going to be a piece of cake. We'll just sit back and watch the MTF do their thing. Everything goes smoothly. We spend a couple of days up in the mountains looking good in black. Some of us better than others, Iris quipped shyly. You should seriously find out if you can wear pants over that thing. God damn it, Adams muttered. I'm seriously going to have some words with R&D after we get back. Priority message. Palisade Broken Menagerie. Rep free 5 Pale BM. At 2200 local time. Operation Camp Granada commences. End of number one with a bullet. We'll now check out the Operation Camp Granada files. Operation Camp Granada Notice. Attention. The attached document packet is classified. Level 5. By the Overseer Council. Do not continue unless you are an Overseer or authorized factotum under Project SCP-008. Codeword Palisade Temblor Witter. If you have received this data packet in error, do not continue. Contact your local Records and Information Security Administration, RAISA, office immediately and report a misdirect Level 5 information packet. Failure to do so is punishable by death. To whom it may concern. MC and D, New York City, London, Hong Kong. Dear sir or ma'am, Marshal Carter and Doc sincerely regrets the unfortunate death of your child during the recent events at our Happy Acres Youth Camp. The losses of loved ones is never easy, even when anticipated, but is harder still when they are taken from us far too soon. 
We offer our sincere condolences and deepest sympathy for your loss. May the outpouring of sympathy, the kind acts of friends and strangers, and the comfort in knowing that your loss is felt by many help you through this difficult time. As a gesture of support, we are refunding all fees charged to you for your recent stay at our Diamond Mountain Resort in the form of a certificate of store credit. Be assured that Marshall, Carter, and Dark will make every effort to find the persons responsible once they have been found and retrieved the proceeds from their subsequent auction, less processing fees, expenses incurred during retrieval, will be passed on to you as compensation for your loss. This will, of course, you will, of course, be invited to watch the auction and subsequent events where the auction winners make use of their purchases. Sincerely yours, Marshall, S. Marshall of Marshall, Carter, and Dark Limited. After Action Report the following after-action report has been condensed from the original. Certain data have been redacted for security purposes. A copy of the full report is available at Site-19 for review and archival. Contact your local RAISA office for further details. Memorandum for limited release. From R. Spalding, Commander, Mobile Task Force Beta 5, Babysitters. This after-action report is prepared in accordance with RAISA Directive 417, Paragraph 3, Section 2-7. Executive Summary Deployed Location, Happy Acres Youth Camp, Redacted, Redacted, Wyoming. Deployed CCOS, Task Force Commander Ronald Spaulding, Beta 5 Actual, SCP-105, Irish Thompson. Special Senior Agent, Andrea S. Adams. Duration of Deployment, 0600 hours. 4 5 2 redacted, through 1 800 hours. Total of 12 hours. Mission Directives to evaluate an outbreak of SCP 008 in the wild. Scope of Operations Deploy Forward Operations Base at Incident Location. Investigate area for evidence of SCP-008 outbreak. Sterilize area of SCP-008 outbreak if possible. Incident Background. Happy Acres Youth Camp is a boutique summer camp operated by Marshall Carter and Holiday Endeavors. Located in Redacted Redacted, Wyoming. Abutting the nearby Diamond Mountain Resort with a footnote here noting that it's a vacation resort operated by Marshall Carter and Dark Limited. The facility offers a discreet summer getaway for the children of our distinguished clientele. In addition to luxury housing for up to 200 children, counselors, and staff, the resort includes backcountry hiking trails, a mountain bike park, horseback riding ranch, rifle range, paragliding facilities, and helicopter pad. The resort also operates several ski lifts during the winter months and is known for its quality of their trails as well as their luxurious accommodations, with another footnote here saying, text taken directly from the Happy Acres Youth Camp brochure published by Marshall Carter and Dark Limited. On redacted date, two persons entered the emergency room at Redacted Redacted Hospital in Redacted Redacted Wyoming, carrying an injured child. Persons report that they were camp counselors at Happy Acres Youth Camp and that the child had been attacked during the night by some kind of animal. Medical personnel discovered that the child had an unusually elevated fever and signs of cellular necrosis around the injury, symptoms consistent with SCP-008. Marshall, Carter, and Dark representatives reported the incident to a Foundation representative. And there's a footnote here noting that at present it is believed that the links to Marshall, Carter, and Dark Limited are incidental. No links between Marshall, Carter, and Dark and any of the victims, staff, or personnel have been discovered during the course of further investigations. See Appendix B for further analysis. Back to the proper article. Prompting an immediate alert to Task Force Beta 7, Maz Hatters. 
Agents from MTFB-7 arrived under the guise of agents from the Centers for Disease Control. Quarantined all persons who came in contact with the victim, placed patient zero into ad hoc containment, and interrogated witnesses regarding the details of the attack. Meanwhile, other agents from MTFB-7 proceeded to Happy Acres Youth Camp under the guise of Center for Disease Control personnel and carried out initial containment there. However, a number of children and adult counselors had embarked on an overnight hiking trip the previous afternoon and had missed their expected return time by over six hours. As MTFB-7 operatives were not sufficiently armed for pacification of an active outbreak of SCP-008, backup was requested under Palisade Broken Menagerie. Force Composition Mobile Task Force Beta-5 Babysitters is a platoon-level task force consisting of 42 operators, including the task force commander and executive officer. The force consists of five squads, numbered 1 through 5. During this deployment, two additional personnel, SCP-105 and Agent Adams, were present as observers, bringing the number of personnel participating in this operation to 44. Initial Deployment MTF Beta-5 was transported to the operations area in 10 vans marked with the livery of the Foundation Cover Organization Species Conservation Project, a conservation and ecology survey group. MTF Beta-5 was handed over command of the operation at 0600 hours. Campgrounds of Happy Acres Youth Camp was designated Forward Operating Base Granada for the purposes of this operation. MTF Beta-5 began preparing the facility for immediate and extended operations. Squads 1 and 2 were given the responsibility of setting up perimeter security, blocking off all entrances to the camp, and deploying remote sensors at key approaches. Squad 3 unloaded equipment from vehicles and deployed them at the camp's recreation area, Location A. This location was chosen due to its large floor space and secure location. Squads 4 and 5 were given the responsibility of sweeping the rest of the camp for any remaining civilians, including all cabins and staff quarters. No outside personnel were found during this sweep. Command Element established Command and Control Center at the Camp Lodge. This location was chosen for its proximity to the staging area and its secure location. Adjunct personnel were also stationed at the Command and Control Center as outside observers. At approximately 0800 hours, Command Element carried out a visual inspection and determined that all preparations were proceeding satisfactorily. Commencement of Operations At approximately 0830 hours, Command Element conferred with each of the unit commanders regarding the planned course of action. Preferred tactics and strategies for dealing with mass SCP-008 infections were discussed and old squad leaders were reminded to re-familiarize their squads with these procedures. Squads 1 through 4 were assigned to perimeter security duty, switching off every 4 hours as per standard procedure. Squad 5 was given the special duty of retracing the planned route taken by the missing hikers. Watch schedules and sanitary slash housekeeping slash safety procedures were reviewed at this time, as were communications protocols and contingency plans in case of emergency. Discovery At 11.52 hours, Squad 5 reported contact with two SCP-008 infectees, later identified as two of the four adult counselors in the hiking trip. Infectees were terminated and marked for later retrieval. Shortly afterwards, Squad 5 reported discovery of a campsite at the planned destination of the missing hikers. The campsite included three three-season tents, 20 sleeping bags, a fire pit, and several walking sticks, knives, skewers, and other camping paraphernalia. Of particular concern were indications that the missing campers had been dragged out of their tents by force rather than devoured in suit. Based on the evidence of an altercation in infectee behavior, the responsible organism was redesignated SCP-008-E, pending further review and analysis. Initial Contact At 12.08 hours, designated marksman Logue 
reported a number of unknowns walking slowly towards FOB Granada along a dirt road in grid reference D9 several kilometers from the operating base. Further observations indicated 15 unknown, 7 boys, 8 girls, possible injured, with no sign of the missing adult counselors. Immediately after, multiple contacts were detected by perimeter security elements, totaling over 50 unknowns. The discrepancy in numbers alerted Task Force Commander of possible complications, including the possibility that dis bystanders in the area had become infected. Following additional sightings, the number of hostiles estimated to be in the vicinity was increased to over 200. Due to the large number of hostiles in the area, it was decided that Squad 5 would not attempt to return to FOB Granada. Squad 5 was ordered to find a secure position and await evacuation at a later time. Task Force Commander consulted with attached observers to determine what aid they could provide. Weapons were provided to the two observers, who set up positions on the rooftop of the camp's Granger station. Abutting Camper Housing Engagement At 13.29 hours, MTF Beta 7 reported that Patient Zero had reproduced by budding. Based on the data at hand, the estimated number of hostiles in the area was upgraded to somewhere in the range of 1,000, dependent on the average elapsed time between replications. It was at this point that Task Force Commander declared a Palisade Rampant Beast scenario and requested immediate heavy backup. Shortly thereafter, a perimeter security report that a number of hostiles were proceeding towards the FOB at a high rate of speed. Engagement proceeded using standard Knights and Archers tactic, with squads 1 and 2 providing the bulk of fire from rooftop firing positions, while squads 3 and 4 provided security reinforced by SCP-105. Two engagements took place at 13.56 and 15.19 hours, resulting in numerous enemy casualties, no friendly losses. The largest engagement took place at 16.06 hours, requiring commitment of reserves and retreat to secondary line of engagement. It was at this point that MTF Beta 5 suffered its only casualty. Agent Logue broke an ankle due to an overly hasty retreat. At 17.03 hours, Mobile Task Force Beta 5 were reinforced by elements of Mobile Task Force New 7 Hammer Down, who proceeded to carry out an in-depth sterilization of the surrounding area. Squad 5 was also retrieved at this time and returned to FOB Granada. At approximately 1800 hours, Beta 5 officially handed over control of the operating area to MTF NU-7 and exfiltrated by helicopter. Post-Mission Analysis Aside from the unexpected alterations to SCP-008's capabilities, the operation was a perfect example of superior tactics and flexibility winning out over an opposing force with superior numbers. All members of Mobile Task Force Beta 5 performed admirably, with individual commendations listed in the detailed appendix to this report. The Task Force Commander would like to make particular note of the contribution of the two adjunct observers to the success of this operation particularly SCP-105, whose immediate response upon the hasty retreat from the first line of engagement at 1606 allowed Task Force personnel to retreat safely without suffering fatal casualties. However, it is my opinion that the current operating parameters regarding SCP-008 are inadequate, considering the alterations to the organism. Of particular concern, data expunged. Intercepted email 1. From R. Spaulding, Commanding Officer MTF Beta 5 Babysitters, to Dr. Sophia Light, MTF Alpha 9 Last Hope, CC, Dr. A. Clef, MTF Lambda 2, still unnamed, 3. Operation Camp Granada. Sophie, Alto, let's get one thing out of the way. If this is the kind of backup that Alpha 9 and Lambda 2 can provide, with only a couple of operators and no official overseer support, I'm itching to deploy them when they're up and running. So good to have actual firepower on our side for once. I admit, I wasn't sure what to think when Iris and Adams joined us in the staging area. On one hand, a nervous-looking blonde with a Polaroid over her tactical vest. On the other, look, I get that the suit's effective. 
I get that it's even useful. I saw firsthand that it's badass. But you have to do something about the design. She looks like she stepped out of a comic book. Anyway, I briefed Adams and Iris on the situation, and we headed up to the summer camp, if you can call it that. Stevens found their horseback riding ranch, and there were goddamn unicorns in the stables. They had Wi-Fi in their cabins, Egyptian cotton sheets on their bunks. I've seen resort hotels that were less luxurious. So, we got situated, set up our kill box, get the men settled in and the perimeter secured. Send Kim and Squad 5 out looking for the hikers. Things start to get real about when Kim calls back and says they've found the campground. Now, right away, I'm getting a bad feeling. Eight zombies don't drag people out of tents, tear tents down. Yeah, eat them. On site, sure. But drag them out of their tents and carry them off? They don't have enough brain cells for that. There's another thing that didn't get past the sensors on the official AAR-2. Kim found a shell casing, 9mm para. Neither of the adults were carrying handguns. Can't get a good read on how old it was, but couldn't have been more than a few days. Could have just been hikers or poachers moving through the area, but no one reported any gunshots. Aside from that, things were a bit quiet. Iris spent some time taking snapshots. Adams mostly seemed to nap. Every once in a while, they'd come over and I'd tell them what I'm doing. Give them some advice on my leadership philosophy and tactics, that sort of thing. Then, Logue tells me that he spotted 15 unknowns. Some of them injured, kid-sized. That started to raise the hairs on the back of my neck. Next thing I know, everyone's calling in for contact reports. All told, we're looking at something in the 1 to 200 range all wandering around the woods, and I just realized we're in deep shit. When Freddy called in, shouting that the kid they had taken in custody had just budded like a flatworm or something, that confirmed it. Zombies are bad enough, but zombie clones? Fuck me. This is about when uh, I went to Adams and Iris asking for help. Squad 5 was completely cut off, no way they could get to us through 200 fucking zombies, and I had a hole in my line with only the two ladies to plug it. Adders offered to take a shield and stand in line. Iris moves to the rooftop and takes over as a DM. I managed to scrounge up a rifle for her. Had to shut down Stevenson's bullshit. Guy's got a big mouth. And she's just gotten up to the rooftop when one of the packs of Zs sees us and runs. I don't know who the hell taught that girl to shoot, but she started off headshotting a runner at full sprint. The jokes and dumb comments stopped too sweet. You can be sure about that. Girl was like a metronome. One shot a second. The ones she didn't kill, she dropped. I don't think she missed more than a couple of shots before the, uh, before the peloton reached the shield wall. But if I thought Iris was impressive, Adams was a goddamn superhero. Look, I know that suit is technically an SCP object, but damn do I want one. Hell, I want 50 so I can give one to every man on my unit. Adams started by shield smashing a Z so hard it tumbled ass over tea kettle and dropped up a couple of zombies behind it. She followed it up with her pistol. I thought she was a mag dumping at first, but every round she fired was a fucking headshot. She only slowed down when she ran out of ammo and had to switch to baton, and that was only until Harding got the bright idea to collect everyone's pistol mags and run them to her. Look, I don't know if you've ever been in a Z attack, but this was something else. Unlike what the movies say, Zs don't usually hit in swarms, it's usually groups of two or three, spurts and packs, ambushes. This was more of a solid wave. And they were all the size of 5th graders. We got hit twice. The second time, we were down to hammers and batons. If the first two waves were bad, the third was a goddamn nightmare. Running retreat all the way back to the kill box. Then Logue breaks his ample jumping out of his goddamn tree and ends up alone in front of the pack of Zs. And everyone knows he's gonna die. Next thing we know, Adams is running out there alone, smashing in zombie heads with her 
bare goddamn hands. Grabs Luke, slings him over his shoulder, starts carrying him back to the line just as Carrion is hitting the clickers for the claymores. Nothing happens. Something must have cut the wires or something, and I'm figuring we're completely screwed now. Then everything explodes. Turns out Iris had the foresight to take snapshots of all the claymore emplacements during the setup. She was able to blow the mines by hand, I guess, and saved all our fucking lives. So yeah, five stars would operate with again. Now, there's one thing that's not on the official After Action report that I want to make sure you guys know about. I've attached the pertinent excerpt from the communications log. J. Kim, Squad 5 Leader, Echo. Ah, uh, Beta 5 Echo to Actual! R. Spalding, Task Force Commander. B5 Actual. I'm a little busy here, Johnny. Is this important? Echo. I think so, sir. Can we get on a secure line? B5 Actual. Switch to Command Circuit 3. Echo. Confirming switching. Uh, Echo to Actual, come in over. B5 Actual. Actual, go. Echo. Echo. Uh, all right, sir. Here goes. We think we've found something you should see. We've retreated into a cave to get out of the rain, and uh, I'm sending you an image now. Over. B5 Actual. Confirming receipt of image. What am I looking at, Johnny? Echo. All right. Real quick, there was a... I'm gonna call it a box in the back of the cave. Steel cube about one and a half meters on the side. Door had a time block on it, and there are remnants of food. Looks like raw meat inside. Claw marks on the inside walls. I did a quick swab check and confirmed positive for SCP-008. Over. B5 actual. Assessment. Echo. Uh, I'm gonna say this was a deliberate release actual. Someone deliberately infected someone with this mutated strain of SCP-008 and unleashed it on the campers. No idea why someone would do that. Over. B5 Actual. I can think of a couple of reasons. Alright, document as much as you can, then spend the night somewhere else. I don't think this strain is any more transmissible than the ones we know, but I don't want to risk it. We'll let you know evac details once I get them. Echo. Roger. Actual, how's your situation? B5 Actual. A bit touchy, but we're holding up fine. The ladies are lending a hand. Iris is a crack shot, but Adams is... something else. Echo. Roger, sir. Good hunting. Echo out. I did a bit of snooping around in the archive stack after we got back. Officially, there are only three organizations who both have access to SCP-008 and the facilities to alter it. First of all, the Chaos Insurgency. I'm going to put the likelihood of this one at low, though, because if it were them, we'd be getting some grandiose statement about the reasons and motives behind it. Despite the reputation, CI usually doesn't do this sort of thing just to cause mayhem. Usually reason behind it. Second, the Global Occult Coalition. I'm going to rate them even lower than the Chaos Insurgency. This isn't their style. Maybe a rogue element? Even then. Though, what's the motivation? Third up is uh, where we start to get a bit worried. The number one organization with the access, asset, and motivation to do something like this is... us. It all seems a bit too convenient, doesn't it? SCP-008 outbreak just as the vote on Alpha-9 is taking place, while Iris and Adams just happen to be in the area. And they just happen to save the lives of a bunch of MTF personnel, too. Major brownie points with the guys on the ground. If I wanted to push a pet project through like Alpha 9, this would be the perfect way to get guys on board. The only reason I'm telling you to this, of course, is that I'm pretty sure you guys wouldn't be behind this. If you were, then don't let me know, otherwise I think every single member of Beta 5 is going to have a long talk with you, possibly involving batons and hammers. What I'm thinking, though, is one of the O5s. Whoever it is who is pushing Alpha 9 maybe decides to engineer an event to push it through over the objections of the rest of the council. I'm keeping quiet on this mostly because, damn it, I agree. We need Alpha 9 and Camp Granada, even if it was engineered. Proves its point. 
but probably a good idea if we all start checking dark corners for men with sharp knives ready to stab us in the back. I'll watch yours if you check mine. Yours, Ron. P.S. Clef. Seriously, do something about Lambda 2's name. I'm sick of the, doing the whole Abbott and Costello routine every time someone asks me for the shorthand. P.P.S. Sophia. I heard the council vote went through while we were in the field. Congratulations on that. Buy you a beer next time you're in town. Intercepted email to from Factotum Cringe to Overseer Council. 3. SCP-008-E, Patient 0. Patient 0 was returned to Site-19. All three instances, original and two clones, were terminated by gunfire. Corpses were disposed of, first by immersion in acid, secondly through incineration, and thirdly through irradiation. Remains have been transferred to intake pending possible classification as special containment procedure anomalies. Strain E, Exocet, of SCP-008. The strain of SCP-008 encountered during the Camp Granada incident has undergone several alterations. First, the average elapsed time between infections and onset of symptoms has been drastically shortened. Coma onset now occurs approximately six hours after initial exposure, as opposed to the original strain's onset period of approximately ten hours. Secondly, while normal SCP-008 infectees are rendered incapable of any action more complex than walking, standing, grabbing, and biting, Exocet strain infectees are now capable of running, jumping, and navigating complex physical obstacles. This is possible due to an alteration, not in the SCP-008 prion itself, but in the addition of nanomachines designated SCP-008 Finback. The Finback nanite appears to have been purpose designed to manage and direct the SCP-008 prion, setting up barriers preventing entry into the cerebral cortex. It appears to be responsible for the Exocet strain's most alarming mutation. SCP-008 infectees have long reported attacking and ingesting living humans, but as the organism results in the destruction of the infectees' digestive systems, no sustenance could be drawn from said consumption. Finback not only prevents the digestive system from decaying, but utilizes the material consumed to construct a rough duplicate of its host body from the DNA harvested from the infectee's body cells. Once enough raw material has been received, the host body will burst open, releasing between one to four duplicates. These will then proceed to seek out and consume any vegetable or animal matter present, growing rapidly to full size in as little as 24 hours. Analysis of both the Exocet Prion and the Finback Nanite indicates that the two were deliberately engineered to operate in symbiosis. Even more concerning are indications that the Finback Nanite shares several traits in common with the now-neutralized SCP anomaly responsible for the death and transformation for one Agent Adrian Andrews, formerly archived under SCP-784 Iteration 6. Speculations and security concerns risen by the Camp Granada incident. The existence of the Finback Nanite alters the list of possible origin points to what? The Foundation itself. Only we have access to the SCP-784 ARC anomaly. Further, analysis of laboratory and containment access logs indicate discrepancies in the amount of SCP-784 ARC material constructed reportedly destroyed and returned to containment over the past 10 years. Approximately 10 grams of nanomaterial are now missing, more than enough to create a self-replicated seed for the creation of more SCP-784 ARC material. For this reason, I am recommending a complete audit of all Overseer-level projects beginning immediately. Whichever party is responsible for secretly developing SCP-008-E must be discovered and their reasons for doing so brought to light. Presented to the Overseer Council for review by Factorum Cringe. Overseer Council, to Factorum Cringe, re SCP-008-E. Your suggestions have been received and are under review. All information pertaining to the SCP-008-E are not classified under Level 5, under code word Palisade Temblor Witter. 
administer amnestics as needed to all personnel aware of the existence of SCP-08-F Finback and sterilize or secure samples of Exocet Finback under the procedure 397 sub Rosa. Upon completion of these orders, you will resume monitoring assets Resh, Semek, and Gimel until further notice. 05-8 Intercepted Email 3 From Senior Special Agent Andrea S. Adams, Mobile Task Force Lambda 2 2 Dr. Alto Clef, Mobile Task Force Lambda 2 3 And that's the end of Operation Camp Granada. Again, today we read Pythia's Wing by the Deadly Moose, Number One with a Bullet by Dr. Clef, and then Camp Granada, which I think is also by Dr. Clef. But that's going to be all for today. Thank you very much for coming. It's, as always, an absolute wonder reading for you, and honestly, I can't wait to see the end of all of this myself. But thank you very much for coming. I hope to see you all again soon, and again, have a great day out there.